Good morning, everybody, and welcome to High Country Fly Fishers 101 Fly Time. Um, I'm going to start out this morning with taking your, your bobbin. I'm going to disassemble mine here and show you how to assemble a bobbin. You take your spool of thread and strip off oh, 8 or 10 inches of, of the thread off of the spool and then take that, so I took that spool of thread and stuck it right between the arms of the bobbin. Then I've, I've got my thread dangling. And if you go to the fly fishing shops and stuff, they sell a tool like this for, for threading your bobbins, but it, it's wire, and it's actually hard on, on some of the, the bobbins like this one is ceramic, and the wire's hard on it. So if you go to your local, uh, drugstore, they sell floss pullers. You can buy about 50 of them for three dollars and that's a lifetime supply. You can give one to all of your friends. But you take Christmas gifts. Take the floss puller and I like to just slip the thread down through the loop of the floss puller if you can see that and then stick the pointed end of the floss puller up through the back of your bottom close to the, th the thread spool and then pull it on through and it brings your thread right through the bobbin. Your bobbin tension should be about enough that it, it comes off of the spool pretty easily so that you, you don't need to pull thread off as you're wrapping around your hook. The thread should unwind right off of the bobbin. Okay, the next thing I'm going to do is put my hook into my vise. This is a spring loaded vise, and there's probably a variety of different ones here, so your instructor could probably help you with whatever style of vise you got. But this, this vise, I'm going to set the hook down into the jaws, and I want the shaft of the hook basically horizontal. So, and if, if you can, hide the point of the hook inside the jaw. That, that hook is sharp enough that it'll cut your thread. No, you, if, if you can keep it buried and still leave you enough room to work on your, your fly, that's the, the best method to go. So I'm going to dress my hook, which means I'm going to completely cover my hook with thread. And if you noticed, I, I started four or five wraps of thread and then went back over the top of it and that locked it all into place. Now I can just run my thread all the way up behind the eye of the hook. Now where I broke my thread, I'm just gonna go back over the tops of that and continue on. And once I get up to the eye, I'm going to go back again to the back of the fly, right at the beginning of the bend of the hook. <coughs> and just to make my flies a little more durable, you don't need to do this today, but I always put a coat, just a thin coat of cement over that. If, you've, if you're an experienced fly fisher, you probably had flies that you started to cast and after a half a dozen fish or casts, the body of the fly starts working down the hook itself, and that, that eliminates a lot of that problem, so it makes life a little easier if you do that up front. Okay, the next thing I'm going to do is put the tail on. This, this is a marabou feather, it's off of a, a goose or a turkey or even ducks can have them, but it's the, it's the downy plumage off of a bird. And marabou is really nice because it undulates in the water. When that's swimming through the water, it gives a lot of life to your boat. This fly is called the RC fly, and it's called that because the, the fur in the dubbing that we're making is typically done with rock chuck, and that's where the RC came from. But uh, it's a Bill Shee's pattern. He's the, the guru of Henry's Lake, and it's a, a great pattern for a damselfly imitation or a uh, small minnow imitation, even a leech imitation. But you can fish this fly all year long and 
One thing that you can see, I'll, I, I, I should have explained that a little better. I, I grabbed the side of that feather and just pulled the feather down off, and on the bottom end, there's a bunch of junk on there, so I'm going to trim it off. And then I'm going to lay those feathers up on the top of my fly like that. And actually, you, you should measure your tail. You want it. You want your tail. I mean, typically in a most patterns, your tail should be about the same length as the body of your fly. So you adjust accordingly. This one I actually like it a little shorter because I do fish this as a damselfly nymph a lot, and they're, they're not as long as that. So I'm going to trim a little more off. Tie that in on the back of the body of the fly. I'm just holding that around there. And there's a technique called the soft loop that's really great for applying new material. If you run your thread up between your thumb and forefinger like that and make a loop and then pull it down, it keeps that material that you're just adding on to your fly from spinning around the hook shank. If you just start wrapping it, often it'll, it'll slide around the hook shank. Now again, that tail is a lot longer than I want, so rather than take my scissors and cut it, if you, if you cut it with your scissors, it looks like a guy with a, a flat top haircut. If you just take it at the length you want it and pinch it in your right hand and with your other hand, pinch off those ends, it gives it a real natural looking shank on there. <coughs> Part of the, the, the reason I'm tying this fly today is to demonstrate the dubbing process. And dubbing is the material that I put in your cup, and it's available in a million different colors. And this, I blended up this dubbing that I passed around yesterday, and it's actually made up from oh, five different colors of dubbing and types. There's fur, I mean, there's two different colors of rabbit fur in there. There's uh, natural fox in there, or natural fox squirrel actually, and then there's some synthetic dubbings in various colors. So I put these colors together to come up with this. Uh, it's really a scope and olive color, but it's really effective. It's a real buggy color. So, so, and you can do that. I mean, you can blend all different kinds of things to get just about any color that you want. There's two fairly basic techniques of dubbing. The first one I'm going to show you is just a spin-on dubbing. And with finer dubbing, you can actually just use the moisture in your fingers to add the dubbing. This is a little coarse and it's a little bit easier to use if you use a dubbing wax. So I hope your instructors have got some wax. If not, we can just pass it around. But I'm going to up and down. Then I'm going to take small pinches of this dubbing. The less, less is more on when you're doing dubbing process. So you don't want to gob it on there. That's a little heavier than I want. That's probably the hardest thing about learning to dub is to learn not to use too much. Add that on there. I'm going to shorten that up now. And I'm just going to wrap that one wrap right over the next towards the front of the fly. You see I haven't got enough to go all the way up there so now I'm going to add a little bit more on there. You want to keep your wraps or your twisting motion in the same direction all the time. Don't twist both ways. Just wrap around like that. Build your body up to the consistency you want it. I'm going to do this with a little bit heavier body. Now I've built it up to the, the just behind the eye of the fly. And that's another thing people always want to do is, is force their material too close to the eye. You want to leave enough space, gap between the eye of the hook and back for you to tie a good head onto the fly and a, and a finished knot. So 
Now I'm going to show you the, the very hardest part of learning how to tie flies is operating a whip finisher. Now I'm not sure why it's difficult, but it always is tough for people to learn. But you take your whip finisher, you extend your thread out five or six inches, and then you hook down with the foot finisher, and then wrap, there's a notch in the back of it, and wrap around it. And then you change directions, and you'll notice where the hook is, is, is pointing straight at my chest, where the bobbin is, is running parallel to the hook shank of the fly. Once you do that, you work that intersection where the cross, where the thread and the, the two pieces intersect at the joint, and then you just simply allow your whip finisher to go in a number of circles there. I, I typically like to do six, and when it's a, a larger fly like this, and I've got plenty of room, I'll do six more to keep that fly from coming apart. So again, you, you, you kind of hold the bead where it swivels so it doesn't swivel too much when you're getting started. Wrap it, hook it down through the hook, around the bend, and then change, put that cross section right next to the hook shank. Yeah, yeah. 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 Then when you've got six on, you tip it forward and let it slip off of the, the notch in the back. And with your bobbin, you pull up that tension, take it out of there and slide it out of the hook. Once that's done, it's created about a dozen half hitches. Every time you go around, it's throwing another half hitch. <coughs> so you can also, if you don't have a whip finisher, or if you don't like a whip finisher, you can you can whip finish with your fingers and do the same thing. And do it across. Is there a flash in this? Oh, I forgot the crystal flash. <laughs> <clears throat> and pull it up like that, or you can take, um, this one's a little big, big, but you can, you can just take, do a wrap around the end of a, a pencil and slide it off. That gives you a whip finish each time you do it. So there are numerous ways to skin the cat. Go put onto a tongue depressor or a craft stick if you go to the craft shop and put it on. You can duck that out and shape it the way you want it. But that fly, it, it would probably account for just about as many fish as I've caught in still water in my life. And it also works well in a stream. One thing I didn't do with this fly that I typically do do, and we'll do it on the next one, is put three strands of uh, root beer crystal flash in the tail and then put a, a crystal flash wing on it. I could throw a wing on this one so you'll see it and then we'll do it again. <clears throat> so that the tips of the crystal flash come out even with the tip of the tail. And I'm going to do four or five wraps over it. You can start out with that soft loop, like I showed you, put it up between your thumb and forefinger and get it going. And then after I get a couple or three or four wraps on it, I'm going to take the leftover and hold it back as well and go back over the top of it some, that locks it in so that it doesn't pull out real easily when you're removing the hook from a fish or something like that. That just gives it a little more light and color, but I tie it both with the crystal flash and without. Some days more subtle is better than, than not, so I'm gonna finish this again. Remember, down, around the back, put the intersection so that the 
the, the line with your bobbin in it is parallel to the hook. The line of, that's hooked into the hook of the hook finisher is pointed right at your body and rotate. And drop it down through the notch, pull it up, and that's a as twisted loop RC fly. I'm going to start out exactly the same way. I'm going to dress my hook with my thread. I didn't mention when I was doing this before, if you keep your thread length when you're working off of your bobbin, three quarters of an inch to an inch long, it makes your tying a lot faster. Another thing that I've taught myself to do, and if you'll start out doing it, when you start tying, put your scissors in your fingers and just leave them there. If you're not having to search for your scissors every minute, you, you speed up your tying substantially. You poke yourself in the eye. You can't poke yourself in the eye. You don't bleed very much, typically. Okay, so I've dressed my thread. Now I'm going to lift a little bit of glue on there. Make it good and solid. Again, I'll show the technique of pulling off the tail a little bit better again. I usually, I try, when I'm tying flies like this, I like to buy a woolly bugger marabou. It's shorter strands and a little thicker. And it, on smaller flies like this, it makes them much denser without being long and straight. But when I do it, I, I try and get three different flies out of one piece of marabou. The stuff isn't very expensive, but it's two dollars a package here and three dollars a package there, and it all adds up when you need to add up all your stuff. So anyway, I, I'll take my feather and hold it kind of top center, and then I do both sides. I'll grab a healthy hump down the one side, and I still have enough left to do one more fly out of that fly feather. Again, I'm going to bunch it all up and trim the junk off the end. If I want a heavier body fly, I will cut this so that the entire length of the feather goes all the way down. But I, I typically don't like this body to get real big, so I don't do that with this one. But that is an option to you depending on the look that you want to have. Okay, there I'm going to take that and I'm just going to pinch that between my thumb and forefinger. Do my soft loop, run that thread up between my thumb and forefinger and down and suck down on it. If you do that about three times, it won't spin. It won't spin around the hook shank. So now I can just wrap and it's locked in there. There again, now that tail is, is about 50% longer than I wanted, so I'm going to pinch it at the point that I want the length to be and then pinch off the end of that and it still leaves a nice, natural-looking tail. Okay, the big difference that I'm going to do with this one, instead of just spinning that dubbing on, I'm going to pull my thread down about three or four inches, and then go back around and tie that in good and solid there. Okay, now I'm going to take uh, three strands of crystal flash and separate them out. And what I try to do is to get one piece to go down each side and one piece to stay in the middle. And that gives you a pretty good angle. And then I'll do a couple of wraps around the hook with it just to make it stay in place while I'm tying it in there. It's easier to do if you hadn't screwed up like I did. much easier, I think, and it's much more durable. 
These, these flies stay together like crazy. I got a piece of black feather in there that I have. I'm just going to pinch off a little bit at a time and poke it up into there. You can also use a little dubbing wax on this if you want to. It makes it a little easier to keep control of it. There again, I'm, I'm getting, what I try to do when I'm doing it this way is put a little bit more towards the head because I want this to taper like a, a damselfly's body is real long and thin at the back and thickens up in the thorax and, and head area. So I'm going to try and build it to look somewhat like that. Then I take my dubbing spinning tool and just spin that. Basically creating a piece of yarn thread there and it stays pretty well in there. If you get some big clumps that you don't want to see in there, you can get rid of them. Then with it still on your spinning tool, you can actually just wrap to the front. Thread is all since twisted and it's really much tighter than the straw. It also allows your dubbing to, to poke out more, gives it a little bit more buggy action. All those fibers, when you're stripping that fly in the water, will move and it gives it make like a leg action and movement to the fly. The more motion you get as you go. Another thing you can do is if you've got your, my, uh, Dubbing brush disappeared out there. Is it anybody got my my tubby brush? Thank you. Thank you. I'm okay, David. I got mine back. So then I'm going to hold that up. That's something I didn't talk about. Whenever you're cutting pieces off of your fly, the piece that you want to cut, you always hold up and then let your bobbin dangle. And that, most of the time, keeps you from accidentally cutting your thread. Well, this is the same fly, just a different technique. It cuts the same fly. Yeah, this is a really good dubbing technique, <laughs> particularly on larger flies. I'll, I'll spin with my fingers like we did on the first one on smaller stuff, and I almost always use a dubbing loop on a larger fly. So, okay, the next thing I'm going to do is finish out my crystal flash wing. And again, I'm going to lay three strands right across the top of the fly. Do that soft loop. He pinches that thread when it comes out. One, two, three times, and then do wraps over that. Then I'm going to take those remaining pieces and pull them back and wrap over the top of them. It just locks it all together. I hate it when my flies come apart, so I try to build them as durable as I possibly can. We hate it when your flies come apart. <laughs> Beggars can't be choosers. Makes us not want to borrow them. <laughs> okay then, basically the fly is done. I'm going to quick finish and I'll show you again. Hook it down with the hook. Wrap around the back of the whip finisher through the notch in the back. Put your, your thread in your bobbin hand parallel with the fly and try to get that thread right next to the, the fly shaft. The other the piece off of the point should be pointed directly at you and then just allow it to spin. One, two, three, four, five, six. Let it slide off the end. Pull it tight. Take it out of there. Do it a second time. You know, on, a, on a tiny fly when you don't want a bunch of body build up, you don't need to do that. Again, the fly in with your bobbin or the thread in your bobbin hand, parallel to the hook shank, right next to the hook. The, the, the hook on the whip finishers are at a right angle to that. I'm going to do more than that because I want to build a little bigger head on that.
Okay, this is a woolly bugger pattern. It also is a pattern that I got from Bill Sheese from Henry's Lake. He's, he's one of my idols as a still water guy, so but you can do a lot of variations on this. This is it's this chenille material that I gave you is black and beaver tan chenille. That's where it gets its name from. But you know, when you do this, it doesn't look like much, but in, in a lot of the waters of the West. There is an evening caddis, and it's a huge caddis fly. And as an adult, it has a, a almost chartreuse green body, but the nymph coming up in the water has a mottled black and tan body like that. So midsummer, this is a killer pattern, and I do it with a, a number of different variations. I tie it with a brown tail, I tie it with a black tail, I tie it with an olive tail, I tie it with a brown hackle, tie with a black hackle, I even tie some with a purple hackle. There's a variation of it we call the black and beaver purple, and you put some purple UV crystal flash in that pattern. But, uh, kind of the same idea as the RC fly. A lot of these patterns, you can, you can make your own little variations. And it's surprisingly, what difference it can make what you do with the fly. Well, this one just, because we had more brown hackle than we had black hackle, I gave everybody a piece of black hackle. Uh, I, I think everybody should have a piece of black marabou. And we're just going to stay with, I'm going to tie with black thread, but you've always got all the thread spun up and you can do it with all of it. No, no harm, no foul. So again, we're going to dress the hook just like we did with the RC fly. And you'll see, I mean, once you learn the basics of tying flies, the rest is just the recipe for the materials. It's real, you know, you've got the, the simple steps down now. You can tie just about anything there is out there in the world. Some of them get a little more complicated than others, but the, the, all the te technique is basically the same. I'm going to do that. I'm going to coat my thread with a little glue. And I, I like... Uh, I mean, this is just a wopsy water base head cement, and I like it for doing this because it has no odor to it at all. Some people think that the head cement can, in, in real calm water, can be smelled by the fish and it puts them off. So, so again, we'll build this from the back. I'm going to put my black marabou tail on. You could put crystal flash in this if you want to. I tie a lot of them without any flash in it, though, just because it makes it a little more subtle fly, but it's certainly something you can do. I also tie it with copper crystal flash as a lateral line, and we call that a, a white hot chocolate. And it works sometimes, doesn't it, Dave? Yep. <laughs> no. steps to it than the other one does. So basically, the last thing to go on your fly, with the, with the exception of your, your tail, is the first thing that you want to tie into wrap. Now this is just a, a super extra small copper wire, piece of copper wire. I'm going to tie it in real good. You can tie it in partially and fold it over to have it not come out, but the way it's applied, it doesn't have a tendency to I'm just going to dangle that out the back. The next thing that's going to go on this fly is the hackle feather. And typically, I mean, the rule of thumb when you're tying a hackle feather, the length of that fiber should just about be equal to the, the gape, they call it. It's the space between the point of the hook and the barb, and you'll see that's, that's pretty close. Cool. You can tie them longer, it gives more action to the fly. You can tie them shorter if you just want a real short leggy pattern, but that's, that is the rule of thumb when choosing a hackle feather, is that the, the feather should be in it. I'm going to tie this one in from the butt end and move it towards the front because it's pretty much a flat 
fly. You could you could go the opposite direction, tie it in from the tip. The, the, there's two different things. When I tie this in from the butt end with the shiny side of the feather facing me and go forward, the uh, fibers of that feather are going to point forward. And Bill Sheese's theory in doing this is that when you strip the fly, those fibers are going to make noise in the water. If you if you tie it in from the tip and go the other way, all the fibers will lay back and it looks more streamlined and prettier kind of, but you lose that sound factor in doing it. So is that so, what they call Palmer? Yeah. Palmer and that. So this and I'm I'm tying in my butt. I stripped off about oh, an eighth to three sixteenths of an inch of the fibers off of that. And I'm gonna lay that right against the side of my body there and do five or six good wraps to tie that in. Okay. And last but not least, I'm going to take my black and beaver tan chenille. And this is available in this in various sizes. This is the small. And I kind of like the small for this size fly. Sometimes I'll use a medium, but it makes the body about twice as thick. They also make it in a large and even a really extra large size so depending on the size fly you're tying you can match the body with the, the hook. So I stripped some of that about an eight to three sixteenths of an inch of the fiber off of that so I'm just going to tie in the thread there and that's, that's going to keep it from building up too big of a lump back here where I'm tying all this material in. Okay now I'm going to run my thread all the way up to the behind where my head is going to be and let it dangle. Then I'm going to take my chenille and carefully just one wrap next to the other, keeping good tension on it all the time I'm going forward. I'm not releasing the tension any time. Just putting one wrap next to the other and moving forward. And if you're, if you're in the vice buying market, if you buy a rotary type vice, you can hold the chenille in your hand and, and spin the vice. It makes it a little more uniform. It's a nice thing. I would definitely not go out and buy a vice if you think you're going to be tying on an ongoing basis that isn't a rotary. Then I'm going to make four or five wraps behind that material. And a couple on the front, and just lock it in, and then trim it off right down close to the line. Again, make sure you're holding it up and your thread is hanging down so you don't accidentally cut your thread. Next, I'm going to take my hackle feather and I'm going to wrap it the same way. Only I'm going to separate each wrap about um, maybe a sixteenth, of, between an eighth and a sixteenth, and you can. Do this, I mean, you can change the entire look of the fly by how far you spread your wraps. I'm going to come around and hold that up. Do a few wraps behind. The wire got in the road here. This is a, one of the exceptions to that rule. We're going to counter wrap this wire so that it goes back. The sole purpose of the wire is to lock in that apple. <coughs> Especially when you're fishing with <coughs> cutthroats, their teeth are so sharp. I mean, you can catch one fish and a tooth will break that hackle, and if it's not tied down, it will completely unravel and your fly's junk. And if you're counter wrap with, with wire or with uh, Thread. And as you do this, if you take your thread and just work it back and forth, it, it'll work its way down in through those fibers without mashing them all down. If I was to just wrap forward with that, 
I would lose about half of that hackle in the process of squishing it all down. get it up and hold as many fibers back as I can and get a couple of wraps there on the head and hold it up wrap it. And I'm going to trim that. Whenever you're working with wire, these are really, they're expensive and they're real fine tip scissors. I've got a piece of junker scissors from old days that I've used, but even with those, whenever you're cutting wire, you want to cut way back in the crotch, it'll ruin the tips of your scissors. So you can spend $25 for a good pair of scissors and they can be junking in a few cuts of wire. So, so it's best if you use a, an old pair, but if you want to use the ones you're tying with, make sure you cut deep into the crotch. I'm going to hold those fibers back with my fingers as best I can. Build a little bit of a head. I'm going to trim those loose fibers out of the way and then put the finish. Remember, hook down, go around the back, put the intersection next to the fly. Tip it forward off the thing, slide back. And I would strongly suggest uh, that you go home and put a hook or two in a vise and just run a lot of wood finish knots. Once you really get it in your head, it's no big deal, but until you do, it's just something that will fight you until you're through. Know. Black Lever Tank.